so we're at 12.30. Um, I think we'll get underway just to make sure that we can try and keep to time. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Women's Infrastructure Network, Oricon and KiwiRail, I would like to welcome everyone to this online panel discussion, The Pathway to Decarbonising Rail in Aotearoa. For those that I haven't met, my name is Sharon Dines and I've recently taken over from Stacey Miller as the Chair of the Auckland Chapter Committee of the Women's Infrastructure Network. Um, as we all know, in 2019, New Zealand passed the Zero Carbon Amendment to the Climate Change Response Act, which sets a target requiring all greenhouse gases to reach net zero by 2050. This target creates quite a challenge for all sectors in New Zealand, including transport infrastructure such as rail. We are delighted to host this panel discussion on the role of rail in meeting New Zealand's net zero target. Despite COVID being doing its best to wreak havoc with our speakers, we have an outstanding panel of women in rail here today to share these perspectives. We expect this session will involve about 45 minutes of discussion with our panel and then about 15 minutes of Q&A. If you have questions throughout the discussion, you can ask them by clicking on the Q&A button in the toolbar on your Teams window. For me, that's at the top right. You then need to click on ask a question and then type away and make sure you hit post at the end when you're ready to submit your question. Rebecca Hollett will facilitate today's session. Rebecca is Oricon's rail client leader and a principal infrastructure advisor with 20 years of experience across Australia and New Zealand. Amongst many things, she led the development of delivering the goods Auckland's freight plan to navigate the critical challenges for road and rail freight networks in Auckland and the Upper North Island. Rebecca is passionate about the future of New Zealand's rail systems where passengers and goods can travel on safe, reliable and sustainable national networks. Joanna Hurd is a principal advisor in the supply chain, sorry, the supply chain team at Te Manatu Waka, the Ministry of Transport. Jo's role at the Ministry has been leading the future of rail and its implementation. Um, <clears throat> this work has been central to establishing a long-term planning and funding framework for New Zealand's rail system and supporting its integration into the land transport system. I'd particularly like to acknowledge and thank Jo for volunteering to step in yesterday and join our panel when her colleague Christy Marsh came down with COVID. Michelle Main is the Sustainability Manager at KiwiRail, where she manages the delivery of KiwiRail's sustainability programme and influences sustainability outcomes across the KiwiRail business. Her primary focus is identifying opportunities in partnership with the business to reduce KiwiRail's carbon footprint. Michelle has a genuine passion for sustainability and her role with KiwiRail is fundamental in supporting New Zealand's transmission to, transition to a low emissions future. And finally, Georgia Goss is a principal in the infrastructure advisory team at Oricon. Georgia has worked as an advisor and sustainability practitioner in the infrastructure sector across Australia and New Zealand, sorry, and the UK. And in particular, she's developed the entire philosophy approach and delivery of sustainability for inland rail, a $17 billion freight rail line infrastructure project for the Australia, Australian Rail Track Corporation. And this included foundation policies for environment, sustainability and sustainable procurement. And I understand there's quite a lot of parallels between that project and the city rail link, which we might go into as part of the discussion. We'd also we'd like to acknowledge and thank Georgia, who has also stepped in to take over from Sarah Sutherland, who is also recovering from COVID. Um, so I will now hand over to Rebecca Hollett, who will get the discussion underway. Thank you, and kia ora koutou. It's my absolute pleasure to facilitate today's discussion uh, with these great speakers. And what an interesting week, month. In, in fact, what an interesting time to be an infrastructure professional. Uh, with the New Zealand budget recently released featuring an emissions reduction plan and uh, sustainability also featuring heavily in the very recent Australian election. It feels really topical to look at the role that we all can play in the journey to net zero. Uh, from 
government, those um, designing and uh, delivering policy strategy right through to the infrastructure designers and then the asset owners and operators. We're really lucky to have representatives from each of those perspectives here today. Uh, but without further ado, um, let's start with Joe. And I'm going to ask Joe to speak firstly to what role the Ministry of Transport is playing in reaching net zero by 2050. Um, and as uh, Rebecca said, I am from Tamano to Waka or the Ministry of Transport. And I think I've got some slides that I was going to take you through around um, our role. There we go. Those have just popped up. Um, so as Sharon uh, said, you will have to forgive me. I have just stepped in as of yesterday for my um, fabulous colleague, Christy Marsh. Um, and Christy has actually a really deep expertise in transport emissions. And if you haven't uh, spoken or heard from her before, I would really encourage you to take another opportunity to do so should it come up. Um, Christy's got a really deep background in this area and has a previous background at MFE and she's, she's a real guru. So I would encourage you, yeah, if you have enough opportunity to do so. But I will try and do her presentation today just this. So just to start, um, just a little bit about the ministry, just in case you don't uh, know our role, we often get confused with um, Waka Kotahi, but we are actually um, a ministry in our own right and we work right across uh, the transport system with agencies in rail, uh, agencies in uh, shipping in Maritime New Zealand and with the likes of CAA in terms of air transport as well and with the land transport system with Waka Kotahi. So we have the full spectrum but our role is primary, primarily around providing policy advice right across that system um, and as we said in, um, was in the introduction uh, we have done really substantial work around thinking about the role of rail in the transport system and working with key rail and um, Auckland Transport and Greater Wellington Regional Council around the role of rail in New Zealand and how do we sort of support it to be more integrated within the system. But more recently we have been working very heavily around uh, transport emissions and supporting the government around the emissions reduction plan which was released last week. Um, and it is a really exciting topic and it is so critical to everything we are, are now all doing. Um, so I just want to take you through a little bit um, around transport emissions and the role transport needs to play in reducing and getting to the government's target. So it's not news to anyone that um, transport needs to play a really significant role in terms of getting to our net zero targets by 2050. Um, transport emissions make up around 39% of our total carbon dioxide emissions, which is why they are always so heavily discussed and why it does play such a, they will play such a critical role. Um, so just moving on to our next slide. The focus really of our presentation today is actually around um, freight emissions within the transport system. Christy and I work within the supply chain team in the ministry and we focus really on the freight system. But I acknowledge that rail um, plays a role both in passenger and freight, but primarily this presentation does cover the freight system. If there are any questions about passenger, I can do my best to try and answer those later, or we might have to park them and come back to them another time. Um, but in terms of the transport emissions profile for freight, um, you just see the slide there and um, the graph on the right. So you will see that road transport while this is a discussion about rail, road transport really is the most significant contributor to transport emissions. Rail only makes up a relatively small part, proportion of total emissions. And really that's a good news story when you think about it. So, and that the reason for that is twofold and it won't be news to anyone. One is that rail is naturally a much lower emitter in terms of its emissions profile, but also such a substantial amount of our road, of our freight is transported by road. So I will talk a little bit more broader than just rail um, and that because we have been really at the ministry working around the whole freight system. Uh, we've just had a question to please share our slides. Can they not? Oh, uh, is that a question about sharing them afterwards? So I assume everyone can see them on the screen now. But we could probably, uh, well, um, I'm sure we can have a chat about whether we can share them after the session. Oh, someone's asking to share them now. Not sure. 
maybe Sharon could have a look at that. Or it might be that we need to, we might need to, if people want to have copies, we might have to share them afterwards because I think uh, Michelle and I will just have to work through whether or not there's anything in there that we have issues with. Um, so sorry, just to continue on, it sounds like most, most people can see the slide, so I will crack on. Apologies to that person who, um, who requested that, but yeah, we'll work that through that afterwards. Um, just in terms of the next slide, so what is the role of the Emissions Reduction Plan, which was released last week? So the Emissions Reduction Plan sets a series of, trans of um, specific targets, and there is one for transport. So it is aiming to get a 41% reduction in transport emissions by 2035. And really, in terms of freight, uh, the focus is on the target three of the four transport targets. And that's around reducing emissions from freight transport by 35% by 2035. And you'll see there again in the graph on the right, the sort of bluey turquoisey colour there is, is around target three. And you'll see how substantial that is as it, as it moves to, to the right. And so the, that's all about the freight system and the contribution the freight system needs to make. So you'll see it is quite a sizable contribution that we need to get out of the freight system. So it is gonna be a real challenge to meet that target. So in, in terms of how we're gonna go about that, um, so again, as, as I talked about already, at the moment, the freight sector is really dominated by road freight. And we have about 93% of the freight volumes on the, in the road freight system. Um, and also the road freight system already has a much higher emissions profile. So that really means that we have got heavy vehicles as our immediate focus. I think the other thing to note that isn't necessary on the slide, but Michelle is going to take you through as well, is that also we've already made quite a lot of investments in um, the rail system that will already reduce its emissions profile further. So Key Rail and Michelle will take you through the fact that we are already doing a um, locomotive upgrade program um, there's also replacements around the ferries and all of those things will also further improve the existing profile of rail, but I won't steal Michelle's thunder with that and I'll let her take you through that in more detail. But in terms of the role of the Emissions Reduction Plan, it basically sets out some immediate actions for how we want to focus. And the first one is continuing to implement the rail plan and those investments that we've touched on already in rail. You'll also probably be aware that there has been lots of discussion about coastal shipping um, and there is some funding set aside in the government policy statement on land transport to support increased use of coastal shipping. We're also implementing a sustainable biofuels obligation, which you may have heard a bit about. And we're also, one of our biggest focuses from here forward is going to be looking at how we can support the uptake of zero emissions heavy vehicles and what kind of infrastructure is needed to support that. And finally, we're investigating ways to support industry to improve, improve fuel efficiency. So those are the immediate actions set out in the ERP. However, we recognise that those are not going to get us to um, the contribution that the freight system needs to provide to our emissions targets. So alongside that, we're also developing at the ministry what's called the National Freight and Supply Chain Strategy. And we're working heavily with industry on that. So some of you may have talked to us already about that. But basically, that strategy, through that strategy process, we're going to look at developing the next set of actions that need to be undertaken and the longer term actions to really get to those targets. Um, so we have been engaging heavily with industry already on that. And we have issued recently an issues paper, which people can also submit on. But if you haven't seen anything about that already, I would really encourage you to pop on our website and have a look at the issues paper. Um, and also, if you if there's, if you have an opportunity to talk to us, please do. Otherwise, yeah, do submit through the issues paper because we are really keen to hear more from everyone and work in partnership with industry to support um, the sector to get to those targets. So that's that's me. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. It's a great opportunity, I think, to um, have a look at uh, the the issues, the challenges, and to engage. Um, 
Michelle, over to you. I guess noting the emissions reduction plan targets, it certainly sets a challenge for transport owners and uh, operators like, like Kiwi Rail, particularly with a growing freight task and ideally a greater rail mode share. So what does the Kiwi Rail decarbonisation journey look like? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, well, as one of the larger energy users in the country, we've got quite the challenge ahead in terms of decarbonising our operations. And um, Sharon, I think I had a couple of slides to speak to here as well. Thank you. Um, so you can see on screen there that we've set ourselves two carbon reduction targets. The first is to reduce emissions by 30% by 2030, and the second, of course, to be net zero carbon by 2050. Importantly, rail produces 70% fewer emissions than the same freight carried by road. So we must also consider the way that we can shift more mode or more freight mode to rail to help bring down the transport emissions overall. Um, we help communicate this benefit to our customers via a Steel Wheels report. And there's an excerpt of one on screen there. And so Steel Wheels is really a monthly report that enables our customers to tell their own sustainability story about how they're taking action on climate change in their own supply chain. So this image shows a summary for financial year 21 in terms of all of our freight customers. And you can see that over 276,000 tonnes of carbon were avoided by shifting freight with rail instead of road last year. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of our carbon footprint, this slide just provides an overview from financial year 21, in which we emitted 232,763 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. Just noting that this is scope one and two emissions only. Um, as you can see, the large portion or around 92% of our footprint is emissions produced by the fuel used from just two assets, our locomotives and our ferries. The remaining 8% of our emissions comes from across the business, including like our passenger vehicle fleet, um, traction electricity, and then electricity used by our facilities. So really, if Kiro was to continue with business as usual, then our footprint would also get larger and larger or increase in line with um, increasing freight growth. So we really need to work hard to reduce emissions on an intensity basis as well as an absolute basis. And um, that's what plays into increasing modal share as well. So we'll really have to take a multi-pronged approach to achieving our carbon reduction of targets. Um, and I think our opportunities can broadly fit under three key tiers of carbon management or the carbon management hierarchy. Different people might have slightly different groupings for this, but. Um, in terms of how we deem our opportunities, you could put them in the avoid category, so where we avoid activities that reduce or that cause emissions. Um, this could include better utilisation of our assets and unnecessary avoiding unnecessary idling. Under the reduce bucket, we've got opportunities to improve the energy efficiency of our operations. For example, we have a DAS or a driver advice system, so it's sort of like a little a little screen inside our mainline locomotives and um, a little bit like GPS for your car, but instead of telling the driver to turn left or right, it tells our locomotive engineers when to coast, brake and accelerate, um, taking the type of topography into account too. And that really helps them improve the locomotive fuel burn and speaks to that energy intensity piece of our operations. And lastly, under the replace category, um, there's an opportunity to replace our assets with lower or zero carbon uh, propulsion technology systems and ultimately eliminating carbon emissions from our organisation. Next slide, please. So I thought it'd be worth touching on some of the um, investment that we've had recently and where we're replacing some of our assets. And Joe, thanks for the intro on this earlier. So as you can see on screen, this year we've got 16 new electric shunt vehicles coming into our organisation. Um, and in the top right there is just an image of what an electric shunt vehicle looks like. So it's a little battery unit. It's about half the size, but just as powerful as the diesel unit that they're replacing in the left hand side of the image. And um, that particular shunt loco was 85 years old. And we recently retired that at our hut workshops. So we're certainly modernising our fleet through these asset renewals. Um, next on the list there is 15 electric locomotives being refurbished. So these are electric locos that Kiwi Rail already owned and they're being refurbished so that they can continue to operate on the electrified part of our North Island main trunk line. Um, you'll also be aware that we recently procured 57 new locomotives for the South Island. 
While they're still using diesel, they're going to be built to the highest emission standard, so EU stage five. Um, they'll be equipped with a range of onboard technologies to help optimise fuel use. And importantly, they'll be much more powerful than our current fleet. So that this means we'll need less locos to carry heavier trains and potentially producing fewer emissions. Um, I think importantly, it's also future proofs uh, the South Island locomotive fleet for future freight growth because we'll have stronger locos that can pull more freight. Also on the list there are our operational shunt locomotives. So these are used for slightly different um, activities to our mainline locomotives, such as shunting. And during this procurement process, we're going to require at minimum a hybrid battery diesel unit with the ability to operate on full electric operation as well. And this will allow some of our older shunt locos within the business to be cascaded down to lighter duties and then ultimately eliminated as well, therefore reducing our reliance on fossil fuel for that fleet too. Lastly in the table, and the one that most people also know about, is our new Inter-Islander Ferry Fleet. So very, very exciting and transform transformational for the business, really. Uh, so the new ferries will be diesel electric battery, and um, they'll reduce emissions from our ferry fleet by 40%. So that's a huge step change and equates to about 16% of Kiarau's overall footprint. I'd also just like to point out that they were the first marine loan in the world to be certified by the Climate Bonds Initiative. And that shows us, or that shows the CBI rather, that we committed to reducing the energy intensity of that asset over its asset lifetime as well. I thought I would also briefly touch on the Infrastructure Sustainability Council, because in addition to replacing our ferries and our locos, we're also building more infrastructure. KiwiRail is a member of ISK, and we'll be targeting an excellent rating on two of our large infrastructure programs this year, or over the coming years. Um, so that being the IREX terminals, or the Inter-Islander Resilient Connection Program, and our Jury Railway stations here in Auckland. So I think the importance of ISK is that it will really drive the measurement and achievement of sustainability outcomes um, through those programs, and also importantly, help KiwiRail target uh, carbon reduction help meet our carbon reduction targets. Um, I also just wanted to highlight or acknowledge our partnership with ECA, who are the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority. So you can imagine that the, um, yeah, the, all of the support and co-funding that they've been able to provide in terms of helping us improve the energy efficiency of our operations. And then they also really provide um, guidance and support to our internal Carbon Zero program. So as you could imagine, with like this level of investment and replacement coming up, the key rail of 2025 and 2026 is going to look very different to the key rail of today. So at the same time as we're delivering on um, this current investment, we're also delivering on the government's investment to upgrade the below rail network, and that will help take us to a more resilient and reliable place for our freight, scenic and metro rail services. Um, we'll then be able to really leverage our modernised assets and our increased capacity and really increase the freight tasks that we can carry. And most importantly, we'll be able to provide that key solution for New Zealand to meet its emissions reduction targets in the freight and transport sector. That's awesome. Thank you, Michelle. So much going on. And you made a nice segue there, I guess, to um, from from the operations, the the rolling stock elements right through to the 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 track and below. I was just having a look at our audience and there's a number of people from different backgrounds and um, probably quite a few who, like me, work in consultancy and wanted to throw to George and now to talk about what is the role of major projects where perhaps our designers, our engineers, our advisors perhaps have the opportunity to influence change on projects of, of scale. What's your experience been there, Georgia? Uh, firstly, thanks for having me. And both to the Ministry of Transport and then to Kiwi Rail, well done. I think it's really important in having that government directive and initiative because it sends really super clear um, messages down through the rest of the supply chain of this is what we need to achieve and deliver. And then Kiwi Rail then putting a really clear framework around how that's going to be delivered and how your projects are going to deliver that. So from a major project point of view, that's gold having the client and the end you and the end sort of client being government that driving it allows it to be put into procurement 
really easily. And as a sustainability practitioner, not having to justify why you want to put it in the contract, I think is really, really um, a great space to be in, which unfortunately, Australia, freight rail particularly, is incredibly disconnected. And so there isn't one overarching mandate coming down from government. And then there isn't one sort of operator and asset owner. Um, and so that creates a real disconnect and it dro- it pulls on very different business levers of what to invest in and, and why. So I think Australia actually has quite a lot to learn from, from New Zealand. Um, major projects are basically the vehicle in which to implement policy and um, the objectives of the end client. Um, and that's that's a particularly large scale one. So inland rail here in uh, Australia is 1,700 kilometres across three different states from Melbourne to Brisbane. It's all inland. And it um, 1.8 kilometre double stack trains going at about 110 kilometres an hour. But the primary driver for for is exactly the same challenge that New Zealand has, which was taking freight off roads, um, both from a safety point of view uh, from a congestion point of view, but also from a, an environment point of view, because 1.8 kilometers of a double stack train is equivalent to about 110 B double trucks, which is an awesome outcome. So inherently, the upside of that project is that sustainability is one of its key outcomes. Um, that being said, though, the focus was still very much on it's a design and construct type project. And so Major projects, if they get the mandate from further above, the trick to making sure it actually then gets implemented is being able to then put that into procurement and then measure and and track that and actually then hold people to account. The additional thing major projects does, if you've got that clarity from from government and, and key operators, is it allows for your supply chain to engage early. So if you are wanting to reduce diesel in your locos or you're wanting to electrify signals or use solar for signals by sending those messages early you can engage with your entire supply chain early but what are the options what exists out there not just within New Zealand or Australia but globally for technical solutions or material solutions for process solutions that actually help you move the dial on your footprint and so that allows that Clarity from above on major projects allows in major projects to have really early conversations with a variety of supply chain members from both your tier ones down to your regional mom and pops about how do they contribute in their assessment and tender reply to those objectives of the project, which then connect up. And then it's it's that it's that age old example of when Kennedy was at the NASA Institute saying to the janitor, what's your job here and the janitor said my job is to put a man on the moon it's that same concept right down your supply chain to be able to say my job is to help create a net zero target for New Zealand and that to me is where major projects plays a really exciting space and actually taking that policy and objective and targets and actually making them tangible and well what does that actually look like on the ground for a variety of uh, stakeholders that's awesome Georgia, there was one question which we'll close out now, which uh, Mark asked, what gauge are you running those double stack trains on? <laughs> yeah, good old Australia likes to uh, create a few complexities. So in Queensland, they have what they call narrow gauge and in Victoria and in New South Wales, they use standard gauge. So the way that the design actually works is it's standard gauge up to Queensland and then it's actually three rails into for the rest of the Queensland to address that narrow gauge. So. The trains from Victoria and New South Wales will make it all the way into Queensland. The Queensland trains will make it to the border and then have to do a turnaround and go back because they're only on a narrow gauge. It's insane. I can't. <laughs> but there is a plan, but it's it's still insane. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, encourage the audience to to put your questions in. We're reviewing that and, and uh, we will come back to those questions with some time for, for open discussion. So uh, let us know what's what's standing out for you, what's resonating, um, any queries you've got. Uh, but in the meantime, loop back to Joe. So we've said a lot of really great context. There's a, there's a lot to consider and a lot that you are engaging with um, the operators, with industry on. 
what what are the elements of the government's vision for the rail network in New Zealand and and how do you see rail freight's contribution to decarbonisation outcomes sort of playing out from the the ministry's lens? Thank you. Um, that's a really good question, and I think you probably will have noticed that um, this government and the the previous coalition government had a really, really strong focus on its vision for rail within the transport system. And it really has probably revived some of the investment that we've seen in rail. And the really primary driver, one of the primary drivers of that was actually rail's lower emissions profile and therefore what it could achieve by playing a greater role within our rail freight and also within our passenger system. And that has been really one of the primary drivers behind that. And I think Michelle touched on some of the numbers around um, its lower profile. Um, but I did just want to give a quick plug to some of the strategic documents that, uh, that do lay out the government's vision for rail, just in case you want a bit more bedtime reading, because we're all rail geeks and I loved that gauge discussion. I've just actually been on parental leave and just come back and I've missed a good gauge discussion. It's great to hear it's still going on. So um, yeah, in terms of uh, the government's overall vision for rail, actually um, what we have been working really closely with Key Rail on over, I think it's, it's say over six years, if not longer now, um, I think Helen Rogers might be in the audience and she might be able to correct me on that on that timing. Um, but is on how do we want to see rail play a role within the transport system? And how can we as policymakers and working with key rail and the whole system make that happen? And what, um, what we realised is that first and foremost, we as government need a clear view on how to what is our vision for the rail network in New Zealand. In the past, um, governments have chopped and changed around what do they want from the rail network. And there hasn't been a long term plan. There's kind of been drip feeding in each budget round uh, just to keep key rail uh, going. But there hasn't been a clear long term plan for the rail system in New Zealand, which has allowed every, the whole system to respond and to get behind and build the capacity that it's needed for a long term infrastructure like rail. So what we have recognised is that we actually do need a long term plan and what we have done is lay that out through what's called the New Zealand Rail Plan. And again, you can find that on our website or we plug there if in case you want to do some Googling. Um, and the New Zealand Rail Plan aims to set out basically the long term vision. It sets out a 10 year investment profile um, for the rail system. And that is based around two key investment priorities. So first is around restoring the rail freight network through a resilient and reliable state. So that is about, as Michelle touched on, taking our existing freight network and bringing it up to scratch um, because it does need a lot of investment. I think the other thing, other investment priority uh, is around um, investing in our existing metropolitan rail networks to support the, the growth and productivity in those larger cities. So obviously we have metropolitan rail in Auckland and Wellington. And those networks also needed a lot of investment to bring them up to scratch. And we've really seen the benefits of that investment over time as passenger numbers on those rail networks have drip, have grown. We have had a few blips there with um, what's happened with COVID and with some of the issues on the Auckland network. But over a long term trajectory, we have seen massive growth on those passenger rail networks. And that really does support improvements in our emissions profile in both those cities as well. So that has been really important. Um, so. I think those are probably the key key changes that we have made in terms of our vision for rail and the way we think about its role in decarbonisation. And again, I'll probably just I'm probably reiterating what I've said already, but the role in decarbonisation is twofold. So one is around mode shift and shifting people and freight onto the rail network to get them onto lower emissions forms of transport, but also that investment in rail itself to improve its emissions profile. And I think that's probably enough for me. I'll, I'll probably let, let the next person talk. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if we if you're interested in enga engaging on our next steps around that too, again, um, we're really happy to chat because I think the other key thing we're aware of is that there are still barriers to mode shift and we are doing a bit of work with Waka Kotahi as part of the, um, our strategy development process 
uh, to look at those those barriers and we're really interested in input through that process so if anyone um, wants to talk to us further about that too also please get in touch fantastic thanks joe um i'll go go back to michelle because i think uh, some of what was discussed there is related and um, you've talked a bit about the current activities the the procurements that are in play now but there's a long-term vision in mind and, and the investment from government the intent to invest and revive rail like joe said gives a good platform for kirao's longer term vision um, there's a related question from the audience which i think you might be able to build in and ellie said it's really interesting that for new zealand's transport emissions to go down Kirao's emissions probably need to first go up. So you, you're wanting to increase the mode share, which is right. So how are you addressing this as a sustainability professional? And it maybe can, um, I think is related to some of your, what we've talked about in the sort of, you know, future focus of, of Kirao, Michelle. Great, yeah, thanks Rebecca and good question. And um, maybe I'll make my way through my response and then I can answer that, but at the end, if it's not already answered. So I guess um, Kirao's future focus is, yeah, how do we actually get to net zero carbon? So I identified a few of our upcoming asset procurements or asset replacements, but I guess our next focus is what we do for our mainline locomotive fleet um, in the North Island. That will mean deciding what to do by as early as the end of this decade. So from the late 2020s on, we'll need to be making decisions about what our next uh, mainline loco procurement looks like. And um, there's been plenty of new and exciting developments in the rail technology sector recently. So it's really about understanding what the best solution is for both Kiwi Rail and New Zealand on our pathway to net zero. Um, some might think that 2050 is just around the corner, but I guess when you're making an investment decision, it can feel quite far away because there's so many uncertainties at play. So as part of understanding what that next procurement looks like, we also need to understand some of the uncertainties that will feed into that process. Um, some of the uncertainties could be technology. So for instance, what is the likely technology going to be available then? Um, and how sustainable is that from a whole of life or supply chain approach? Um, in terms of the supply chain, again, how will rail be used in supply chains in the future? What will the supply chain look like? Is it gonna be markedly different to what it is now? And then finally policies. So what policies will the government put in place to support decarbonization from the transport system? And again, how will the supply chain respond? Um, so in helping us to get to the right answer or a set of answers, we've had to develop some potential future scenarios. So they're really based on different mode shift goals, different supply chain factors, plus uh, the freight volume estimates from the National Freight Demand Study. And those are gonna help us sense test what the most ideal solution will be. So far, and it probably won't be much of a surprise, but some of the emerging technologies or options for consideration will be electrical energy. So that would be through the expansion of our existing overhead electrified network. Um, hybrid options, including a battery hybrid technology. And that, that could also have the benefit of um, utilizing a partially electrified network. And of course, there's carbon neutral, carbon neutral liquid fuels, um, so principally biofuels or an additive or a substitute to fossil fuel. So you'd still be maintaining the, the internal combustion engine componentry of a regular or a diesel locomotive. Um, and then lastly, green hydrogen. So we'll need to focus investigations um, on the application of hydrogen fuel cells, including the supporting supply chain or infrastructure that would be required for those. The work will ultimately conclude with a recommendation for an option or a suitable suite of options, and then that will go into a further detailed investigation um, scenario. But just to provide an example of what the future of rail could look like um, in terms of our net, net path, net zero pathway, is that we could see the completion, say, of, the, of electrifying the North Island main trunk from Auckland through to Wellington, and then potentially partially electrify other parts of the network. That would allow a hybrid type locomotive solution to travel under the wire and recharge and then travel on battery on the um, un unelectrified part of the network. So the benefit of an option like this would be that it would reduce capital costs um, because you don't need to fully electrify the network. And we know that there's quite a heavy cost associated with full electrification, but it still allows us to move away from being reliant on diesel. And so it supports our carbon reduction targets while also making rail more affordable a more affordable mode of transport. Um, 
Essentially, I think what this really identifies is that for Kiwi Rail, there's probably no single solution to reducing our emissions. Instead, progress towards net zero carbon will be dependent on multiple technologies um, and different scenario testing will help us get there. Um, you know, we'll have our new diesel electric hybrid ferries, we'll have battery and or shunting technology. We'll also have our upcoming future locomotive procurement strategy. And we also must not forget to maintain a continued focus on um, the energy efficiency of our operations. And that probably speaks to the question that we received via the chat is that at the same time as we're encouraging modal shift from road to rail, um, we need to still be bringing down the energy intensity of our current assets to help mitigate some of that effect. It won't, um, it won't reduce all of the additional emissions. And I think that's why it's an important conversation we need to have with the MOT in terms of uh, the freight sector target allocation and, and what that looks like. And I understand so far that MOT aren't looking to do a sort of bi-mode breakdown, but it's a collective contribution to the freight sector. And so then that will be the role that, that rail can play is by enabling the freight sector emissions to come down, um, as well as pushing us to yeah push ourselves to reduce that energy intensity of our operations. So we're really looking forward to the freight supply chain strategy being published by the ministry next year and seeing some of the other recommendations that come from that. Thanks, Michelle. There, there have been some other questions in the chat, I guess, about that, that systems approach to freight um, and uh, costs and affordability. Um, also the role of inland ports and, and maybe we can loop back to that. But just, Georgia, I wanted to come back to you first and you know, having heard a lot about what's going on and being targeted in New Zealand and your experience in inland rail, <clears throat> you've already said perhaps Australia's got a little bit to learn from New Zealand, but what lessons learned could you share with us? So I think the the lesson learned to date huh, for inland rail particularly was that early, so while the mandate didn't come from the government to set some sustainability objectives and targets. Uh, I did at Inland Rail um, and I made them publicly available within the first annual sustainability report so that basically we couldn't go back on them. So <laughs> I think being clear from the outset what those objectives and targets were and then finding ways of embedding those requirements through all the different systems and processes in the project life cycle. So we looked at everything from people's position descriptions through to what went in procurement, how things are assessed in procurement, what it went into contracts. You know, we really looked at all the sorts of elements that contribute to the success of those objectives and making sure that everybody understood their contribution to those. So you look at the ISC rating is a great example. It's a great tool for assessing sustainability success. But a number of those credits don't sit with the sustainability manager on a project and nor should they. Um, a lot of it sits with designers or the enviros or the stakeholder engagement leads and it's really important in order to deliver that writing that all those people understand that requirement. All those people feel empowered to uh, contribute and see the value in that because there's no point a sustainability practitioner trying to explain to a stakeholder engagement lead how to do a stakeholder engagement plan. Like there, it needs to be a collective and I think that was the real success of what's happened on inland rail is that there was a culture created and everybody really fully understood how they contributed to that success. Thank you and uh, keep, keep your questions coming. There's there's a couple here and maybe um, <clears throat> I'll ask Joe to, to think about this one because it, it does ask a question about policy. So it was that question about what, what role will inland ports play in reducing BKT? It's that sort of systems approach, I guess. Um, Josie went on to say that uh, she seemed to think at some point New Zealand used to have a policy that actually limited the distance goods could be trucked and uh, she was asking what's the likelihood of that being potentially used as a future policy but I guess what's the, the policy view to um, increasing the, the utilisation of the rail network and perhaps controlling that, that mode shift? Um, that's a question for me, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think there's probably, yeah, two related questions in there. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that um, we've taken a 
what I would call a supply side or an investment based approach um, to supporting node shift to date. Um, so we've really been focused on how do we supply the right infrastructure and enable key rail to provide the right services and the passenger network to provide the right services to support that mode shift onto rail. So we've really been focused on bringing the infrastructure up. Um, but we do acknowledge that now that there has been such significant investment that we do need to consider whether there are any barriers to that shift onto the um, from the demand side. Um, so why are our shippers not using rail? Will it be sufficient, the investments that we're making um, in that, those service improvements and those changes that Key Rail will make to make people shift more freight onto rail? And through making the passenger network more accessible, will those things be sufficient to have people shift? Um, and I'd say those are those are still open questions from our perspective, and we're really interested in views on um, whether they will be sufficient. As I said, we are undertaking some work around the barriers to um, uh, rail freight mode shift with Waka Kotahi at the moment, and um, we're working with uh, EY on that. So we are interested in views on that. I think one of the the solutions which has been discussed in, in the questions is around what are the role of, um, sometimes people call them rail hubs. I think they're more like integrated land transport hubs because um, it's all about bringing road and rail together to um, to get that scale and then get, uh, get things onto the rail network from the road network. And there has been a lot of investment in that through the PDF and we have to, um, again monitor that and make sure that that's having the desired impact or whether there are going to are still more barriers to those hubs being used and whether they are having the impacts that that were envisaged so that's really um our approach to date and we're really interested in um feedback or thoughts on that thanks joe uh in my own experience i think working on the auckland freight plan um there was a lot of really great engagement with um the the transport operators. So in that case, mostly the road freight operators in understanding their critical challenges and what was influencing um, affordability decision making. Um, Mark has asked a related question around probably some of those um, intermodal hub solutions that at the moment he states that it's cheaper in many cases to leave freight on a truck for the whole journey rather than to do the intermodal transfer. Much of the cost is in the loading and unloading and what can be done to address that. So in a lot of cases I know in those those freight hubs automation is um, becoming much more prevalent. Um, I think the scale and size of those hubs is important to create efficiencies and, and optimization. But I'll throw that out there, perhaps Michelle or Georgia. Um, any other insights to um, how we can help make that that interface and ultimately the mode shift easier and cheaper? R rail, freight rail has to have be competitive at the end of the day from a business point of view. And so when inland rail was designed, it was they engaged quite heavily with their customers. <clears throat> and it was very much around what do you need in order to move off of trucks onto freight? And so it was things like reliability, like 98% reliability, less than 24 hours between Melbourne and Bridgman. It was a variety of these sorts of things. And so the design and the operation of that in planned infrastructure has been very much driven by what the customer wants. So working out how you move um, freight from truck to rail, I suspect is that conversation I'm guessing is quite critical to the national freight strategy that the MOT is developing, I would have thought, um, and looking at how you can, what needs to be built into the infrastructure to allow that cost competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, keep the questions coming. I think we've almost exhausted them. There's one more. And um, can I make it, just, a, Michelle, just a quick comment? Sorry, Rebecca. I'm just oh, yeah, of course. of course. Um, I would just say yes. That is um, one of the actual key purposes behind the development of that of the national freight and supply chain strategy. Because the other thing we really acknowledge with that strategy is that we have been taking 
there has been quite a modal approach in the past. So we've been looking at each mode, but we haven't been taking an integrated approach. So that is one of the purposes behind doing a national freight and supply chain strategy is to try and take a more integrated approach and look across modes and how how do you get them to be utilised in the best way for the right thing? Um, but also how do you get that um, that connection between road and rail and the hub link and such like? Um, so yes, that, that is one of the core purposes behind that. Fantastic. So Michelle, um, Mark asks a question about plans to electrify the remainder of the Auckland to Tauranga route. And uh, you, you touched on this briefly before when you were talking about the, the systems and, um, you know, uh, opportunities to uh, lower the energy intensity of the, the network of operations. How's that, uh, the, the, the extension of electrification playing into Curao's plans? Yeah, well, um, as I mentioned earlier, thanks, Mark, for your question. Um, it's definitely part of our consideration in terms of the investigation we're doing for our future procurement strategy for locomotives. And so we're still not sure yet what that mix or that solution will look like. Um, but an answer like that might come from uh, a more detailed investigation if we were to they go with further network electrification. Um, it could be a, a partial solution. And certainly the, you know, the Golden Triangle, the Auckland Hamilton Tauranga route would seem to make most sense because that's where um, we've got a, a heavier or higher freight, freight volume through that part of our network. And so that's where the economic case would be more justifiable or more clear compared to, say, our South Island route, routes where the, the volume of freight just doesn't stack up from an economic case to electrify. Um, so it could be part of the solution. Um, sorry, I don't have a straight answer for you, but um, it will be considered as part of the detailed investigation that we do. Beautiful. We've come to the end of the questions that I can see in the, the chat. So I guess maybe um, before I hand back to, uh, there's a hand up. I'm not sure if I can, can someone see who has? It was someone oh. named Louise. Okay. It's uh, it's gone again now. I'm not sure. Can we open up um, for people to ask ask questions, turn on their sound, and ask questions? Paige or Sharon? Maybe just while we're um, waiting for that answer, um, any any final thoughts from uh, yourselves? I guess I'll go in the same order again. Um, uh, Joe, any final thoughts from from you? Um, I just wanted to say thank you um, for organising this session. Um, I think it's been really valuable to bring us all together, which I think was touched on at the start from government um, through to key delivery agencies such as Key Rail and then through to major projects. And it's great to hear that um, that direction that government is setting is helping that um, sustainability journey and the emissions uh, profile reduction flow through to um, projects on the ground because that's really the core reason why we're doing this. Um, and I'd just give one final plug to say yes, come. We're really keen to engage with industry and partner with everyone on our on the development of the new supply chain strategy. So do pop on our website and take a look and um, stay in touch with us. We're really keen to hear from everyone. Thank you, Joanna. Um, Michelle, over to you. And perhaps um, the, there has been another question pop up about the perception challenges with mode shift. In uh, Is it the same or less than um, getting mode shift in freight as it perhaps is with, with passion, passenger transport? Sorry, so is there a risk that our capital investments now compromise the 2050 goal without integrated long-term plans in place? Um, uh, it's a is different that, question. Different but question? If you, Sorry. If you've got a comment on that one. Let me just the go to the, the last yeah. one in the Q&A bar was um, about the, the mode shift challenge for moving freight um, from road to rail. And do we have the same or different perception challenges as there is with passenger transport? Probably slightly different challenges with um, shifting to passenger transport. Um, I know, Joe, you touched on this earlier as well, but yeah, how do we get people out of cars? Is it a convenience thing? Is it a 
like having a, you know better locations in terms of um, public transport hubs as well and how they're serviced by bus routes or how people can actually get to the beginning of their public transport journey. So um, I think there's probably different challenges in, in terms of that shift and that target in the emissions transport chapter. But Joe, I'm not sure if you had anything to add to that. Um, no, I think I think that's fair. Um, I think one of the things, I mean, on a slightly slightly side or side note, but might be a, a similar perception issue was that we encountered when we were looking at um, the location of ports of Auckland, and there are different perception issues with um, freight and it being located on your back door compared to um, passenger. Um, so, but yeah, the, I think. Yeah, I don't know if I have any answers to that, but I just would say, yeah, there are probably different perception issues. And again, we have to work through exactly what those challenges are. And I think I think this is also where it's quite important that having Georgia here as well is you do. Sometimes we do get a bit too uh, centric on the whole discussion of. The whole rail network or the whole um, passenger network, but actually we have to look at the cases on a project by project basis and whether they stack up for um, for investment and so whether the demand is there. Um, and I think that that going through those really thorough business case processes, which Waka Kotahi run and such like was also another reason for bringing rail into the land transport management system, which is some of the other recent changes we've made um, to make sure those demand side issues are also considered. So I don't have any answers, but yeah, I think it is an interesting question. Mm. The the last question that's come up, and I think it relates to that systems approach and you know bringing um, looking at the national land transport outcomes as a as a whole. The question asks whether there's a risk that our capital investments now may compromise the 2050 goals. I think ultimately when we saw the graph and we saw the contribution of rail to emissions compared to the totality of transport emissions, um, the yes, rail emissions may go up, but they are a lower emissions outcome to move freight um, than the, the trucks on the road. There's a number of benefits. So um, thoughts um, around, you know, what is what do our what is our long term rail network plan? do to contribute to the 2050 goal. I think it's a lot of what we've been talking about today with a, an aim overall to reducing emissions, um, but it's part, part of a systems approach. Any other comments on that from our panelists? No, I think just to um, reiterate the, the systems approach that's needed um, to address that so we're not all operating in silos and you know, we do play a complementary role within the freight sector. So um, I think again, that the freight supply chain strategy will really highlight some of those key opportunities and synergies and to make sure that all different components of the freight sector are aligned moving forward to reach our 2050 target. Yeah, and I would agree with that um, as well. And but I think the other thing we probably have to acknowledge is that um, Key rail couldn't, so there were some end of life investments that needed to be made. So starting that journey with the investments in King Key Rail to support that, um, it really needed to happen. But we do recognise, yeah, we're going, we need to keep working on how we um, develop that integrated system, and uh, that work will be really important to come. Georgia, any final thoughts from you? I think for me, I think one of the biggest lessons learned out of inland rail and rail in general is this in Australia is that it's a relatively risk adverse industry and rightfully so, you know, it's um, safety's number one. But if we are going to address decarbonisation in rail, the adoption of new technology, new materials, new processes needs to ramp up um, in order to actually meet those targets. And so I think the real challenge for the likes of particularly Kiwi Rail is how do you how do you trial and test those new processes, materials, et cetera, um, recognizing the risk profile uh, of rail in general? So I, that's the lesson for, from in Australia is that what I've noticed is that it's a very disjointed approach on adopting new technology and material and 
there seems to be a lot of people running in those silos of developing certain things and how rail adopts that stuff quickly without the age old you know needs to be in play for 50 plus years before we adopt it on a grand scale i think it's going to be a, if we can unlock that i feel like rail will move through that decarbonization journey very quickly Awesome. Well, I see we're almost at time. I wanted to thank all of our panelists very much for your insights and context setting and um, views to the future of um, our targets. Uh, it's an exciting journey and uh, we've all got a part to play, I think. Great to hear that um, the Ministry and KiwiRail um, are so open to engagement and um, from a, an industry perspective, it's great to be continuing these conversations and encourage you all to do the same. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd also just like to thank Rebecca for um, chairing the panel today. Um, it's fantastic. Thank you all for coming and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Sharon. Bye.